And uh, of course, mashing the two together, we could say, you know, perhaps this novel coronavirus variant of what the SARS outbreak looked like is is a mother of all viruses. But maybe that's a bad, bad mashing up. But regardless, at least for me, I don't know if you felt it. This pandemic time is um, it's it's like a watershed moment. There's sort of there's the BC time b before uh, COVID. And then there's the AC time, there's the after COVID. And it almost sounds like the name of a, a, a sort of rock and roll ran, band, right? BC, AC, but I mean, that's maybe to come. So this watershed moment of, of COVID, um, and then of course, Acts 1, if you mash those up together, uh, the ascension of Jesus, um, the ascension is sort of another watershed moment. This is sort of the before and the after. And I think where I see the similarity, at least resonating in my crazy brain in this moment, is that both of these watershed moments, COVID-19 and the ascension, are kind of thinning out, squeezing down kind of moments. Uh, for example, in this, um, AC time, this after COVID time, there's a thing, at least for me, there's a thinning down or a squeezing out of our list of priorities. I think whether people think about it consciously or not, we're sort of thinking, what actually is important to me now? You know, I've been involved, busy, busy, busy doing stuff. Um, um, there's a thinning down in this time of COVID of what, um, what our needs are. Do I really have this big list of needs? I think for many of us that's been thinned down to something core, something essential. Um, and so the, the ascension, COVID, if the ascension is a watershed moment in the Christian story, um, and it's a thinning uh, moment, I could sort of do a Monty Python take on this, but the theory, you know, is I don't know if you're familiar with I have a theory, a theory which is mine and mine alone, but that sense that because of the ascension of Jesus, here's my thesis, uh, that the gap between the divine, the other, God, Jesus, and us humanoids has been thinned out, squeezed down. Um, you might have heard about thin places, or there's a fancy pants term called liminal space where there's the sense that in these spaces, the barrier, the boundary between the other, the transcendent God, the divine Jesus, and us is thinner than in other places. Um, but so the ascension is this triggering watershed moment. This is the thesis, and I have a few exhibits to make the case. It thins down time and space so that the gap between the other, the transcendent, God, the divine, Jesus, is very thin. That gap between that world and our world is not as thick as it was. And so the question I'm going to begin with and end with is this. It's for me, and I think it's for all of us, is do we have this expectation that this gap is actually thinner than most of the time we want to experience it as? And do we live as if it's true, like the world being on fire with a presence that's bigger than just our ordinary? So with that set up, uh, who's going to, oh, Mary, you're going to read the, um, uh, the Acts 1, verses 1 to 11. And I think just before you read, as we hear this, imagine what the biblical story would be like without the ascension, okay? So let's just, I'm just saying, just imagine if we didn't have this record of the ascension, what would be missing? Okay, take it away. Okay, um, I've got these pictures here that cut off my words, so I've got to change the way, way this looks. Uh, I if I can reduce my screen to so I can see my bulletin, I did better that way. <laughs> or if you want, you can hit the little um, minimize button at the top of the pictures. It's a little line that might help. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yep, that's better. In the first book, and everyone, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Mary Carol, or MC. Mark, you need to take attention. I'm not Mary. I am Mary Carol, or MC. MC is just fine. <laughs> In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mary Carol. You know, if you're comfortable, there's a story with your name. I would just be curious. You know, I messed it up by just calling you by the first <laughs> name. Sure. But what is the story, briefly? Um, my, I'm a happy song. I have a grandmother who's a Mary in the traditional M-A-R-Y. So there was a bit of that, and that's my father's mother. And my mother's mother had a friend whose name was spelled like this, but it was Mary Beth. And my mother dropped the Beth and put her own sister's Carol in there, so I became Mary Carol. Happy song. So there was a more than a January baby involved in this fancy pants name <laughs> that I've loved, except when I was in kindergarten and had to learn to spell it. <laughs> well, thank you. That's lovely. I, I, I thought there was a little story there, and it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice story. Um, uh, you know, the best Christmas pageant, speaking about your, your Christmas time, happy song kind of name, there's the... Um, the Herdman family take over this traditional Christmas pageant. And one of the readings about, you know, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, you know. And uh, the Herdman response to that, my God, he'd never get out of kindergarten if he had to spell his name. Anyway, that's, that's one of my memories of the Christmas, <laughs> the names there. Anyway, so just... I don't know if you had a thought to think, like if there was no ascension story in the Bible, right? We'd have to have some way of getting Jesus out of the scene in our heads. Um, you know, maybe he just disappears. That could work. Or, you know, it, it, maybe he changed his name, went back to carpentry because as he was reputed to have said, this Christ gig is just killing me. It's just killing me. Um, uh, but I, my growing up, Ascension gets short shrift in the, in the Jesus 
story. I didn't grow up with it featuring strongly. You know, if there was a soundtrack to the Jesus story, it might go, you know, like the birth, the baby. It's kind of, ooh, ah, isn't that wonderful? Christmas times, merry carols, right? Um, then, of course, there's the death. Oh, ah, <laughs> you know, that's that soundtrack. Resurrection is this woot, woot, Easter, uh, you know, high five. And Ascension, at least for me, was kind of like the sound was, meh, you know, whatever. Uh, it didn't feature uh, strongly. Uh, but anyway, let me just sketch out my case that the Ascension, this is the main point, triggers this thinning down of the space, the gap between us and the divine, the other God and Jesus. Um, that gap is actually thinner than than, it, than we perceive it to be. Um, so I have three exhibits, just very quickly, as we want to just walk through some of this text. Uh, exhibit A is the plot. You know, in verse one, uh, where it goes, um, this Dr. Luke is his second book. He says, in my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. It's an interesting phrase, but the implication is that Jesus began it, but Jesus is actually continuing to do and to teach. It's very interesting. Um, and how is this possible? You know, the actors in this uh, passage, it's hard to miss the actors here, the Trinity, in a sense, at work. Um, you know, God and God the Father, um, that's the, the traditional language, he, he is, you know, these passive verbs is taking Jesus up is promising to send the Holy Spirit, says the Father in action. Uh, then Jesus, of course, we see here is teaching and uh, instructing. And then the Holy Spirit is coming to fill them both with the presence and the power of God. And it's, to me, it's very interesting. The Bible never has like the equivalent of a TED talk on the Trinity. You know, listen up, people. I've got 17 minutes of awesome content. Uh, and here it is, you know, it's hard, this one God, three persons. No, it talks about, when it talks about the Trinity as God, this community of the Godhead in action. And, um, but the, the, the deal is here, it describes this community of God, this Trinity in action, and this sense that Jesus actually has not checked out of the picture yet. That's exhibit A in the plot. So if that's true, there's a possibility if Jesus is not fully checked out in some way, that Jesus is continuing to do and to teach. Um, you know, it's not the case of the lights are on, we've got all this Christianity churchy stuff and actually nobody's home, as it might be the case if you came to visit me in my final decrepitude you might say, you know, the lights are on, but Mark is not home. Uh, but no, the lights are on, and Jesus is still somehow doing and teaching. So that's exhibit A. Uh, exhibit B, in my thesis, that this ascension event is a really watershed triggering moment of thinning down time and space, so that this gap between the other and us is very thin, is, is our part, as it's talked about. And um, I love how there are sort of two receivings in the text. In, in verse 2, the language where it talks about was taken up, has as its root receiving, was received up. And then there's the receiving in verse 8 that it says, you will receive us. You will receive miraculous power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. So exhibit B is this, this sense that the same Holy Spirit, according to this text, that was and is was with Jesus, is going to be and in and with us, uh, his followers on the open way, as we might say. And I think our response to that is sometimes, uh, are you kidding me? Really? Uh, and the short answer from the text and from uh, what I'm making my case is no. The long answer is no. We're not kidding. Um, the easy way of explaining this away would be to say, well, that was a one-off thing for the, the apostles. Or maybe it was for that limited time where they needed a little turbo boost at the beginning. Um, but I think the, the more sim simple reading is that, no, 
this is how it is that there's this reception god is fully present on this side of the gap um, and in a sense to me that's the heart of the, the the good news the gospel the evangel which we we wonder right in verse three where it says jesus was saying those things about the kingdom of god i think that's what in the nutshell was jesus was making clear and for me this heart of the kingdom of god is that god is with three prepositions god is for us god is with us and god is actually in us and um, you know all the main pieces of the christian story because of the death and resurrection of jesus from the dead all that we think separates us from god we could label it sin or whatever has been dealt with god is for us then god is with us not just in the sense of a nice hallmark card on our windowsill that you know says i am with you and uh, sign god you know or with you with you with you it echoes across the empty cosmos no but in the sense of um i don't know if you've taken a nine volt battery and put it on your tongue there's that sense of the little current going like zzz, there's little there's a little shock um that live wire sense the sense that the world is on fire with the presence of god um in in things like nature i think at this time of year in vancouver it's hard not to miss that the world being on fire with the presence of something the other light art music whatever love so that's god for us god with us and then of course the amazing thing god in us god's holy spirit according to this text takes up residence within us god is on both sides of the gap i don't know if you ever traveled in london on the tube there was used to come this recording message mind the gap you know the gap between the train and the platform well i think we should mind the gap you know that gap is thin god is on both sides of that of the gap and uh, so in, in our belonging handbook at open way as we've sort of fleshed out how do we get on and stay on this open way adventure it's making this leap of faith to actually say okay i'm going to choose to live as if god is for me god is with me and god is in me um so that's exhibit b and exhibit c finally is is in my case that the ascension is this triggering moment in time and space thinning out squeezing the gap between the other and us is that is the the posture that's encouraged and that comes from two shiny men in verse 11 men of galilee why do you stand looking gazing into heaven that sense of our posture is to be on the earth not so much focused gazing up into heaven how the whole show is going to end for example uh you know it's sort of in our language some of the x marks the spot um our preoccupation is to be with the horizontal uh not just the vertical because this is where it's all happening um but i think we find ourselves gazing up into heaven when we think of the ascension and we do have questions um our posture is not always on the horizontal we wonder about this vertical dimension like for example with their language why is heaven up there and what's with the cloud right and we can answer that partly because their intellectual furniture was such that heaven actually was situated up there and they were comfortable with the image of how would you describe the presence of god being somewhere you use a cloud when they built the tabernacle early in the wanderings and they finished it what was the sign that actually god was there well guess what a cloud comes and overshadows the tabernacle so if you wanted to indicate the presence of god uh, you know the, the ascension you would going you would be going up and you definitely have to have clouds you know there will be clouds or as in the sense there will be blood uh, that too um but other questions are more intriguing to me is what does it mean if jesus is embodied and is on the other side what does that actually mean right and i don't think we can make any definitive answers uh who knows but i think one thing is clear to me that the godhead this trinity as we name them father son and holy spirit 
Um, they understand us humans like they never understood us before because one of them is embodied. At least that's how I kind of think. Uh, because one of them has an embodied, the Godhead has come into this new experience of what it means to be human. Um, anyway, our church in the small, in the New West edition, we're wandering slowly through the Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, which talks about spiritual practices. And this focus on the horizontal, the chapter looked about being grounded. And she talked about walking a labyrinth. I don't know how many of you have walked a labyrinth or are familiar with it. If you aren't familiar with it, it's sort of like a, a circle with a spiral path, maybe 20, 30 feet across, which you walk in slowly into the middle, and then you walk slowly back out with a, you know, a posture of paying attention to things. And as we talked in our small group, most of us, except Marianne, had a much more positive experience, <laughs> most of us sort of said, well, you know, the, 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 the labyrinth didn't sort of work because you sort of think, well, in two big steps, I could be at the middle and out again. Why am I spending, wasting all this time? <coughs> but I think the walking the labyrinth is an example of this reality of being focused on the horizontal, paying attention to the journey, not so much the destination. Destination is important, but the journey really, really matters. Um, and it's funny, this is so ironic, you'd think that the destination would be the center, but in the labyrinth, the destination, well, it sort of isn't, is the center, but it isn't the center because you go back out again. Um, anyway, so because the gap between the other, the divine God and Jesus is thinned out, triggered by this watershed of the ascension, um, then it's on the journey here on earth we should wake up to the fiery presence of God, not wait for it all to happen up there, some I idealized future. Anyway, so I think I end with the same question as for me and for you, you know, if this is true, that the watershed of the ascension triggers a thinning down of time and space. By the way, Mary Carol, you used the word fancy pants before. There's a fancy pants word for this called liminal space, right? That sense of, mm -hmm. But, you know, in a good sense, um, it, it, you know, if, if that's true, we should expect the world to be more electric with the presence of God and bring that just as you can walk the posture, the labyrinth with no expectation. And that's sort of what you'll get. I think as we live our lives with little expectations of the fiery presence of God, we by and large, most of the time will experience that. Um, but do we live as if this was true? You know, do I? And so I, my encouragement to myself and to all of us is, let's live with the expectation that the world is this liminal, thin place. And as we do that, glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is actually now on this side of the gap world without end. Amen. I have